All right, welcome to Full Momentum and HEC Raz Vodcast. My name is Ben Carey. I'm your host, and here joining me today, as always, is Chris Cadell. Chris, welcome. This is episode two. Hey, Ben. Good to talk to you. Good to see you. Uh, still doing that remote working thing, so uh, this is a fun way to get together and talk about Heck Raz and other things. So uh, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. And before we get into some of the technical stuff, I just wanted to take a second because obviously you know, we find ourselves in a pretty interesting place in the world. Obviously, work has changed for both of us and many other people, uh, life in general, uh, a lot, not very many activities going on. Uh, and, and one of the things that I know that both of us are really kind of missing is, is, is sports right now. And so I just wanted to give kind of an opportunity to allow us to highlight kind of some of our interests and, and really just in general, what are, what are we missing most about sports? So I what know what say, you're missing, Chris? Ben. I know exactly what you're missing out on. It's no secret there, but uh, I'll go first. Yeah. I uh, I'm missing out for sure on sports. Uh, I really uh, enjoy uh, this time of year because uh, we've got uh, MLS soccer going on. Um College baseball. I'm a, a big fan of college baseball. I love watching games and, and following that. That's a lot of fun, too. Uh, the one I'm worried about, though, I'm really worried about college football. That is my number one sport. And if they cancel the season, I'm going to be heartbroken. Uh, I, I'll feel lost. I'll feel lost. How about you, Ben? Yeah. And, and you know, the Beavers, and for those of you guys that don't know, Chris is a big Oregon State fan. The, the Beavers made a, a yeah. great jump last year in football. So hopefully uh, they're able to take the next step this fall. Yeah. Progress was made, slow but steady. So uh, we're hoping to build on that and maybe have a little bit better year this year. But who knows how things are going to go now. No, no spring balls taking place. Uh, if they have a season, everyone's coming in cold. Maybe that's going to be an advantage for Oregon State. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I like the optimism. Level, level the playing field, right? I like it. I like the optimism. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for me, obviously, this this whole – you know, pandemic started right around the time of year. That's that's my favorite time of the year as far as the sports calendar goes, because the NCAA tournament got canceled and being a big Gonzaga basketball fan, that was a, a huge blow to my psyche. But, um, uh, you know, they everybody... totally they definitely would have won it all this year for sure. Yeah, I, I, is, yeah. I, 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 was, I was up. I was optimistic for sure. Um, so obviously that was a big blow. And then, you know, I think like you, this time of year when the weather's starting to get really nice, we've had such a nice spring here in the Northwest. And, you know, I would have already inevitably had gone to a few Mariner baseball games up in Seattle and, and there's nothing quite like it, you know, going up with friends and the sunshine and um, watching baseball is, is just such a, a fun, fun thing to do at this time of year and kind of welcome in uh, the nice weather. So definitely missing that aspect of things. Yeah, for sure. And I would I'd be interested to hear um, the, the folks listening out there, what uh, sports in particular they're missing out on or, or they're missing and what their favorite teams are that they uh, can't see play right now. And hopefully that will all come back soon. But let us know. Uh, be interested to hear what you guys are uh, missing sports wise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, every, everybody has different interests and I think everybody's are being affected by this. Uh, but hopefully sooner than later. Um, we can we can start to have some of those live sporting events back in our life. So uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So Definitely. now let's get into some of the meat of this podcast. So we're going to start this off a little bit differently. Uh, I'm going to do a segment, uh, hopefully every every podcast, where we either dive into uh, a development in the water resources engineering world, something new that's come up, maybe a cool project that's being conducted or look at something uh, historical and, and the historical significance uh, to the hydraulic uh, engineering world. And that's kind of where our topic is today. So Chris, I'll ask you just off the top, if I told you that uh, in the fifth century BC, there was a city that had uh, a pretty substantial network of of weir, bridges, dams, channels, water mills, rivers, and moats, all uh, connected and controlled via a central castle that also functioned as a dam. Would that be interesting to you? Absolutely. I love historical hydraulics. Um, I love reading about how people back, way back then, um, 
you said fifth century BC, right? Yeah. You know, uh, the, the way they were able to control water with very, well, compared to today, almost no technology. And um, so I'm intrigued. Let's hear about it. Yeah. So this, uh, this location is in modern day Iran. Uh, at the time that it was established, it was the um, first Persian Empire. Uh, so definitely kind of off the beaten path, not necessarily a location where we attribute um, uh, massive hydraulic engineering feats. But this is this is a really, really cool project that I just kind of stumbled upon uh, doing a little bit of research. So the name of it is called the Shushtar Historical Hydraulic System. And I'm going to share my screen here just so viewers can see some of these cool uh, pictures yeah, as I, and i as i understand it ben the persian empire was quite substantial back in its day uh very um advanced um kind of world leaders in a lot of for that time the technology of the day yeah absolutely. so this doesn't really surprise me that uh what you're about to show is is situated in in uh iran what used to be persia yeah, so what happened was, uh, again, about the 5th century BC, uh, the leaders of, of this city here in Shashtar um, decided that they wanted to divert the Kuran River uh, into a diversion channel that would surround the river uh, for de defense purposes. And that was obviously something that was very normal to do back in the day. Um, but the the Persian Empire at the time, again, like you said, had some some really, really smart folks in charge, and they decided to not only build a defense system, which you can see here, separated this main city from surrounding the surrounding uh, area, but they decided to uh, take it one step further. So after the canal was diverted, um, they put in a second dam uh, away from the diversion dam that uh, ended up being kind of a control network or the brain of the system that diverted water to four different canals that uh, went to different locations around the city. Uh, these canals um, uh, get, supplied drinking water, they removed waste, uh, it, it supplied water to water mills that were, that was obviously a huge um, important uh, function in, in those times for, for, um, for various purposes. And yeah, so it's just a very, very intricate uh, design a lot of really really high level hydraulics for the time again this was 200 years before the first roman aqueduct went in so we're talking cutting edge stuff and today this obviously isn't as um, remarkable or as beautiful as it was back in the day when it was created but still really really cool to look at and get an idea of, of the hydraulics that, that were being uh, analyzed uh, back then so you can see yeah. here in the center this is the main control dam and again, this is where the various canal diversions were located and they could control where they wanted to send water at, at different points. Um, and if we go through here, you can see this is a, let's zoom in here. This is a map of, again, you have the canal coming down here and then a, the control dam, which is located here. And this actually also functioned as a castle at the time, um, mm. which, was, which was really cool. So it was, it was a very high priority location for them from a defense standpoint and from a water distribution standpoint. And then the various uh, the various canals from this dam got diverted into, again, different cities, different water mills, different locations. And the result, um, oops, my photo got lost there. Let's go to the next photo here. <clears throat> was a, was a, just, again, a, a really cool achievement. And you can see all these different outlets where the water is, is still flowing today. And this water is actually still used today for, for drinking water purposes and for, um, for various other reasons. The, the main uh, use of the water downstream of this area now is agricultural, um, but it's still it's just a really, really cool project. That is, and, yeah, that's really cool. Are you able to zoom in a little bit more on that, on those images? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so again, you yeah, can that, see some of these various uh, outlets coming through the different sides of the of the city here, and uh, this this really does look like almost a modern day dam with a powerhouse in it. So yeah, so what do you think about modeling this in Hecrats? 
<laughs> a little complicated, huh? Yeah, it'd be challenging. You'd have to incorporate some some serious trunk lines and and obviously some culverts and some weirs. Um, it would it would be yeah. pretty complicated. But the fact that these people were able to do it um, and that this was built in, uh, they're approximate about three to seven years. Uh, a lot of that was obviously done mm. with slave labor, but nonetheless. Um, a, a quite an achievement and again this this is an example i really like this picture here of uh one of the one of the weirs um that's located so again this is uh, a weir that's that's part of this system here um you can see it looks very similar to what a weir on a on a modern small dam would look like that we deal with today so so there we've got a, a vertical lift gate, sluice gate. And so we can uh, model this as an inline structure or an SA2D area connection in RAS if we wanted to do that. Um, yeah, I think it could be done. I think you could do it. Yeah. It take a little bit of work. <laughs> yeah, so all the tunnels, though, the tunnels are the trick because, you you know, you can't really model tunnels. I mean, you can. There are ways to do it, cross sections with lids and so forth. But uh it's certainly tricky to do tunnels in HECRAS. Yeah, absolutely. It would be a challenge. It may be something that uh, we'll have to work on in some of our spare time over the next few months to see if something <laughs> like that can be All done. That spare time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so just a, a cool, cool opportunity to highlight uh, a neat project that was done a long time ago um, by people that really understood hydraulics at a fundamental level and were able to apply it. So. Um, that's uh yeah it's really cool ben thanks for sharing that um i uh i, I think uh folks are going to really like that uh so look it up on google uh there's a great view on google earth if you want to see it from uh, top down and uh read up on it too i mean we only have a short period of time to talk about it here but uh, there's lots you can read about uh if you just get on the google machine absolutely yeah, yeah. Could be good. All right. So uh, before we get into the technical topic for today, I just wanted to uh, have a chance to thank our sponsor for today's episode. And that is uh, our firm, Kleinschmidt Associates, who is known throughout the industry as a firm that provides practical solutions to complex problems affecting wa energy, water, and the environment. You can learn more at kleinschmidtgroup.com. So thank you, Kleinschmidt, for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, go check out our website. It's a really cool, really well-built website, a lot of information there. In fact, that's one of the ways you can find the RAS Solution and the Full Momentum podcast. Absolutely. So uh, check it out. Um, now we're going to get into the graphical cross-section editor, the theme of today. Um, this is one, It's it's been around for a while. It's very powerful. Um, it's very convenient to use. And if you haven't found it yet, uh, you're in for a treat. This is this is a really cool feature. It really saves a lot of time too when you're doing work in your geometry. But let's let's uh, let me show you how you get there. So from your main RAS window, go into the geometry window, okay. And up in the tools menu item, you've got the graphical cross section editor. So I'm going to click on that, and here you see a uh, a graphical view of a cross section. Okay, and we can scroll down. I'm using my wheel mouse so you can go through really quick. It's a quick way just to scroll through all of your cross sections and see um, if things are lined up right, if you've got your bank stations in the right spot. Okay, you can also use the arrow keys to do the same thing. So once you've got this drop down highlighted, you can do, use the up and down arrows, arrows to move around. So that's a quick way to go from cross section to cross section to make some uh, graphical changes. Yeah. So what can we do in here? Yeah, Ben, what what you got I was a just question? gonna add that, you know, I think people are 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 very familiar with the cross section editor. Um yeah. which you know is 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 very common to to use and, and that obviously is is one of the main uh interfaces there in the geometry window and and that obviously contains your station and your elevation data as well as the ability the ability to quantify Manning's values, reach lengths, bank stations. Um, but it doesn't have some of the same customization abilities uh, that the graphical cross-section does. And the graphical cross-section editor is also much, much more user-friendly if you're trying to, for instance, change the bake stations at 20 cross-sections. Um, that would take yeah. a, a long time to do in the, the cross-section data editor, 
but in the graphical cross-section editor, uh, it can be it can be it can be done very quickly. That's exactly right, and, and that's why this thing is so powerful because it's a very quick way to add features and to move features around, mm -hmm. but it's not precise. So I want everyone to understand that it's not precise when you do it in here because you're clicking on on a palette, you're not entering in numbers. So for precision you would go back to the old cross-section editor and there you can put in the numbers of your features and you've got your ineffective flow areas, your levees, your obstructions, okay? But to do it quickly, you can go right into this graphical cross-section editor and there's even a shortcut button to get there. This button right here in the um, cross-section editor, you click on that and that takes you to the graphical cross-section editor. Now here under options, you'll see all of those same features are in here. You can add station elevation points. You can add normal ineffective areas, blocked ineffective levees, obstructions, and you do that just by clicking on the graphic itself. So let's say I wanna add a levee right here. Okay, I can just go to options, add levee, click on it. Going to ask me since I'm inside the main channel, is it a left levy? Because it doesn't know since I'm in the main channel. I'm going to say yes, it's on the left side, and there's my levy right there. Okay. Um, let's say, uh, you know what? I don't really like that placement. I want to put it over here instead. Just go edit, move objects, click on it, and just move it over there. Yeah. I've got a levy over there. Okay. I will. And I will add a detail that when you are moving objects to be very careful because again since this is not a precise thing it's it's very easy to accidentally move one of your station elevation points or something that you're not necessarily trying to move so just be very cognizant of that when you're moving items yeah that's a really good point um and what i found is raz is pretty smart in that it if there's a feature like a levee or a bank station and you click and there's also a station elevation point, it usually assumes if you're anywhere near that levee that that's what you wanna move. Mm -hmm. But yes, you do have to be careful because you don't wanna move a station elevation point. But that gets me to one of the other really cool features here. This is one of the only places in all of HECRAS where you have an undo button. In this case, it's a menu item. So you can undo your edits now the problem is it's gonna undo everything I've done. So it won't just undo the last thing, it'll undo everything. But if I click on that, notice the levy goes away. Yeah. Now let's say I wanna add an ineffective flow area here. Right click, add normal ineffective area, click right there. Again, it's, since I'm inside the main channel, it's gonna ask me if it's a left one. If it's a right side one, I would click no but it's on the left side. So I'll click yes. And there's my ineffective flow trigger. And I can go back, right click and move objects. So I can move that trigger up here. I can move it over here mm -hmm. if I want. Now it assumes this is a left one because it asks me, is this a left or right ineffective? It's a left. So if I put it all the way over here, it's actually gonna block out everything to the left of it. Okay, yeah. because this is a left side. So if you want one on this side as well, you gotta get a little bit tricky. Sometimes I'll just move that outside and then I'll add another ineffective flow over here. Now I've got my two normal ineffectives. Can right click, move those around wherever I'd like. Mm -hmm. Okay, this yeah. one probably logically would go right there. Um, doesn't look like there's probably any need for one on the right hand side. So I'm gonna go right click again and I'm gonna delete it. There, delete it. Okay. Yeah. And so I think th this is this is a good illustration too of the fact that you can obviously move the location of those ineffectives and the elevation of those. But again, you're doing it in a qualitative fashion. So the graphical yeah. cross section editor is really good for qualitatively editing your cross sections, qualitatively changing the location of the banks or the ineffectives. But oftentimes we know the elevation. For instance, if we have an opening of a culvert or a bridge, we know the elevation that we want our ineffectives to be at. And so right. what I always like to do is qualitatively assign those parameters in the graphical cross-section editor, and then go back into the cross-section data editor and make sure that those, uh, the quantity, the actual elevations of those or the actual stations are exactly where we want them to be. Yeah, that's a really good point, Ben. And, and here's a really cool feature too, is 
if I were to move this ineffective flow up above the water surface, so you can see that the, the max water surface is already plotted here. If I move it up above, watch what happens. Now it's ineffective. It shows up as ineffective. So this is a great way to know how far you have to move your trigger point down to get it to be either above the ineffective point or below it. Mm -hmm. So when you're fine tuning, not fine tuning, but when you're, when you're going back after a run and resetting your ineffective flows based on the results, this is a great way to do it. So um, I showed you the ineffectives. If you, if you want to do a blocked ineffective, you have to actually do two clicks. You have to click two sides. So here and here, and that makes a block. That will automatically turn your other one into a block. So you can't have one normal and one blocked. It's either all blocked or, or all normal. So when you do that, um, when you make a blocked one, it's going to make that one blocked as well. And then I can move this up and down just by clicking and dragging on. If I can grab it, there we go, or move it side to side like that. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's uh, let's undo edits, and let me show you another really cool feature. Uh, if you go up to this toolbar here, these are your bank station options. So I've got a number of different ways I can move and set bank stations. I could just click where I want to by selecting this button, and let's say I want to put the bank left bank station here and the right bank station there or there. You just click where you want it. Really easy. Okay. Another thing you can do is you can use these toggle buttons. So this is going to move the left bank station around. And this one will move the right bank station around one point at a time. Then we've got these features in here. This will automatically, I'll start with this one. Actually this one, this will move the bank stations to the endpoints. Okay, or sorry, to the water surface. So if you've got a water surface in there, it's going to actually move them out to the closest point to the intersection of the water surface with the cross sections. And then you click on that button and it will, if they're above it, it will bring it down to the water surface. So this is just a quick way to get it to the water surface. I don't use these two options because I technically or typically will look at the terrain and let that guide me for where I put it. Uh, put my bank station. So I'm going to click on this and I'm going to put my bank stations right here and right there. Now to apply these settings to save it to memory, you just have to move down one cross section or up one cross section. Yeah. Okay. And now once I've done that, I can't undo it's, it, it is what it is. Okay. Um, yeah. So that will uh, solidify it there. Let me add a, a really cool, important part of the bank station assignment here too. This doesn't happen very often, but I've run into it uh, more times than I would like to. And that is if you're trying to put both, both bank stations on one side of the Thalweg of your channel, HECRAS will not allow you to do that. Um, and this, again, normally you would think, well, I'm not gonna have both bank stations on one side of the Thalweg of my channel. But oftentimes the terrain data sets that we're given that we use to cut the cross sections from don't always show the lowest elevation to be where the channel actually is. So yeah. for instance, we might know that the channel is actually in that left higher elevated right area or there or yeah, yeah or even above that. And or we might there. want to yeah. put the bank stations on either side of that. You're not able to do that in the graphical cross section editor. Mm -hmm. You Let me show it. you how you do it. Uh, yeah, you're right. You can't you can't do that with this with this tool right here. So if I Correct. try to click a bank station here, it actually moves that one down because it sees that as the Thalweg. Exactly. This is the left bank point. This is the right. It's not going to allow me to move this to the left of the main channel. Yep. But all is not lost. We can we can still do it in here. It just takes a little bit of trickery. So what I usually do if I want to make that my bank station, I'll, I'll set my left one. I can do that. Now, notice if I try to click here, it's going to just move the left one over there. But what I can do is I can click as close to the Thalweg as possible mm -hmm. like that and then just use this button. Yep. And do some multiple clicks until I get it into position. And so that's that's one little workaround, but and if you got a really long cross section it could take some time to get it there. Yeah, absolutely. But, so uh, I just wanted to let way. I just wanted to let people know that because it's been frustrating for me in the past because you don't understand what's going on, but it's just a good yeah. lesson to learn that you can't have both your bank stations on one side of the Thalweg of your channel, uh, or you, I should say you can't quickly assign it. There are, there are some tricky things you have to get.
use in order to get that to work. So yeah, let me show you a really cool trick, Ben, too, uh, on end values. So I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but you can actually move your end values around too. Let's say I want this to all be 04 like that. I can just click and drag that over. Mm -hmm. All right, just like that. However, I want to set it up, just click and drag. Uh, I can even click on the number and change it if I want to. Maybe I want to make that 05. Okay, I just changed the end value there. Now, one thing you can't do in this graphical cross section editor is actually add more end value breakpoints. Mm -hmm. So you can't add in more end values than you already have. So you'd have to go back to the cross section editor to do that. Here's a question for you, Chris, that I don't know the answer yeah. to. When you change the location of those Manning's uh, associations to your cross section, does that automatically change the, if you go to the table, the Manning table, does that change the assignment type? Because there's two types of ways to assign Manning's to a cross section, either via station or just mm. inside and outside the banks. So when you Yeah, that's a really that, good question. Yeah, my guess is because I've moved these off of the bank stations, if these were if these were on the bank stations, mm -hmm. then I think this would preserve that left channel right kind of three subsection convention of setting your end values. But because I've moved those off like that, then I think you're going to find that it's got horizontal variation. And we can check on that. Mm -hmm. I'll just apply those changes. I'm going to go back to the uh, cross-section editor with this shortcut button right here. And here you can see, yes, we have horizontal variation in end values on that cross-section. Now this one, the next one down, has your end values listed here. Mm -hmm. So I can mess that up too if I go to the cross-section editor. If I just move this like that, apply it, just went up and back down. Um, or down and back up. And then notice here now it's gone to the horizontal variation in end values yep. in this table. So yeah, good question. And, and definitely something to be aware of when you're doing this, because some people don't like to have this horizontal variation. It tends to make interpolation a little bit more messy and it, it just tends to add a little bit extra layer of complication or complexity to your model. So just be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, let's get back into the Cross, graphical cross-section editor. And uh, I want to show you another thing that can be done in here real quick. And that is comparing geometry files. Yeah, this is my favorite feature. <laughs> so if I click on this box right here, it's going to allow me to pull up another cross-section or another, another river station from either the same geometry or a different geometry file. I only have one geometry file, so I'll just... Uh, compare it to itself. But you can see here, I've got this river station, 93391 uh, in the graphical cross-section editor. And the one I'm comparing is 13815.4.4. Now let's say I wanted to borrow the Thalweg from another cross-section, maybe one nearby. I'm gonna scroll down here until I get close to 920. I'll just go right to it, in fact. So there you can see I've got the exact same cross section, but maybe I'm missing some of the thou egg and I want to borrow that from another cross section. Okay, let's go back. Uh, oops, I'm gonna go back to this one here. And then this one, I'm gonna go down one. Okay, and uh, it rescales it. That's why it looks a little bit different there. Uh, actually, let me go down. Go to here. Okay, now notice that they're not lined up, but that's okay. I can fix that because I use the merge cross sections tool and there's a shift X and Y that you can make use of. So if I click in here, I can change this number. Let's make it 100 and see what happens. Okay, didn't really change much because notice the scaling is thousands of feet. So let's make it 1000. Oh, sorry, I meant to type it in here. <laughs> 1,000, okay, that didn't get it there. I can go 2,000, okay. Or I can just use my shift key. I'm gonna take this, this is the uh, the shift 
or shift interval, use the shift key and the right arrow and left arrow, and that moves it around. So I'm using the right and left arrow keys while holding the shift key down. Okay, and I'm going to line this up so I can borrow this thou wag from the cross section 89060, and I'm going to plug it into this one. So I only want to grab this part of it. So let me zoom in a little bit closer. And now I'm going to move these red lines over because these tell me what portion of the cross section I'm going to merge in. So I just want to grab this portion right here. I'm going to put those like this. I'm going to tell RAS to merge on the inside. So the inside of these two red lines, that's where it's going to merge. So it's going to take this pink line and it's going to apply that to the black line. So let's take a look when I hit that. All right, there, I've just merged the, the interior of that cross section uh, from the other one. Now you can do this with a different geometry file too. It doesn't have to be the same one. And this is a great tool when say you've got um, a hydro survey and you've got bathymetric data in your cross sections, but in another geometry file, you have say LIDAR terrain where it doesn't include the bathymetry. This is a great way to blend in the bathymetry with terrain based or LIDAR based cross sections. Yeah. What do you think, Ben? Yeah. I mean, this, this is a really, really powerful tool. You know, like you said, using it to incorporate bathymetry data from one data set into a data set that doesn't have it is probably the most common way that we use it. Uh, it's also nice because like you said, you can shift uh, X and Y there. And, and oftentimes we'll shift the Y if we, for instance, want to propose that we're going to dredge a channel or there's going to be some sort of proposed change to the elevation of that channel. You can shift that the channel elevation there and then merge the shifted elevation with your existing cross-section to kind of manually lower your cross-section as well. So a really powerful tool. Again, there's almost an unlimited number of applications you could use this for uh, and, and much, much easier than doing it point by point in the normal cross-section uh, viewer in the from the geometric data editor. <laughs> Yeah, very good points, Ben. And so this is a very quick summary of the graphical cross-section editor. I'm going to undo this and um, let's undo those edits. And just a reminder, though, when you put elements in using the graphical cross-section editor, always go back and make sure that the values are what you want them to be. So go back to the cross-section editor and fine tune. So, for example, if I add in right click to add in a normal ineffective flow area right here. Now I can go, let's apply that by clicking down and back up. Now I can go to the cross section editor and there's my ineffective flow. If I double click on the uh, label down below here, this will take me to the ineffective flow editor. And in here, I can now fine tune this. Let's say I really wanted that to be 818 with an elevation of 671. So now I, I fine tuned it, okay? Yeah. So uh, just make sure you do that if you need to. But a lot of times you don't need to get that precise, especially when you're doing ineffective flows to simulate, uh, let's say, backwater eddy areas or um, um, contractions and expansions in your river. Now, when you're around a bridge, though, that's that's a lot of times where you're going to want to get a little bit more precise than what you can with the graphical cross section editor. Yeah, that's perfect. Again, if, if there's one takeaway point. In the graphical cross-section editor, that's going to be editing uh, your cross-section qualitatively. And then in the cross-section uh, editor, in the geometric data editor, that's going to be editing your cross-section uh, quantitatively, so with a higher level of detail. So. Yeah, correct, correct. Very good point. And this gets me to our uh, segment here in this podcast, the Full Momentum podcast on tips and tricks. So we want to give you guys uh, tips and tricks as much as possible, hoping to do this every podcast uh, episode. But the one that I'm going to demonstrate here really quickly has been around a long time. And a lot of you already know about it. So I understand that. But there are a lot of people when I teach this class who are blown away that they've never learned this tip, this trick, because it's not in the manual. So when you're in any of the windows, the graphical windows in HECRAS, it could be the geometry window, it could be any of these outputs like the profile plot, 
it if you hold down the, it, it could be the graphical cross section editor. It, it could, yeah, absolutely. So if you hold down while you're in any of these windows, hold down the control key. Look what happens to my cursor. It changes to a, a little measuring tool, right? Uh, a square with some crosshairs in it. If I click a line, click and drag a line and then release the control key, it now actually gives me some information about that line, like the length of it. So if you've got a geo-referenced model like this, then it will actually give you the true length of this line. It also gives you the delta X and delta Y. That's not very useful here, uh, but perhaps the coordinates are very useful. Um, so one thing that uh, Ben and I have used this a lot for is when you put in a lateral structure, by default, the, the normal way you put that in, the easy way, it's not geo-referenced. But nowadays, it's, it's really advantageous to have a geo-referenced lateral structure. And so if you put in a lateral structure and say you want to geo-reference it, and maybe it, uh, you know exactly where it is, you can just click, hold the control key down, click points along the center line or the crest of your lateral structure. And then once you've got it, release. And now I've got all the coordinate points that I just clicked right here. I can copy this table going control C, go up to the GIS tools, get into the lateral structure center line table. And for whatever lateral structure, I don't have any in here, but let's say I did, I could just paste it right into this table. And now I've got a geo-referenced lateral structure. Again, I don't have one in this data set, but if I did, I would click on the lateral structure I wanted to do this to. And that would be a way to um, geo-reference it. Yeah. You can do the same thing in the profile plot too, right, Ben? Absolutely. So here's an example uh, of a profile. And maybe I want to measure the slope of the terrain. That's a common thing to want to know. I could click, uh, hold the control key, click, follow that slope as closely as possible, release the control key. And now I've got a dy, dx. That is my slope right there, 0.00164. It also gives me the length of that line. Yeah. And it gives me the, the length in the X direction, which somehow I got exactly 24,000. That was lucky. <laughs> and then in the Y direction, 39.4. And I also get the coordinates there as well. Yeah, I think that the two most common applications that I use this tool for are just what you outlined here is measuring the slope of your reach. And that's something that then you can use as a normal depth for a 1D boundary condition, which is super helpful. And the other application that I really like using it for is in 2D, if you have a culvert that you want a specific inlet and outlet cell, you can draw, use that measurement tool to draw um, between two different cells, get the coordinates of that and actually copy those coordinates into the coordinates of your culvert. And that will geo-reference that culvert location and actually allow you to specify where your inlet and outlet elevations are at, which is really, yeah. really helpful, specifically if you have, for instance, a very low point in your terrain. So for example, if I wanted to put in um, an SA2D area connection right here, I could draw it like this. There's my SA 2D area connection with a really uh, boring name. And if I've got a culvert in here, if you don't give that culvert coordinates for the inlet and outlet, it's just gonna take water from this cell and put it into this cell. But let's say the culvert is actually this long. So as Ben said, I can just hold the control key down, click a line representing my culvert. Maybe I want it to go here. And now I've got the coordinates for the inlet, which is row one and the outlet row two. And I can put that right into my SA2D area connection for my culverts. So if I've added in a culvert here, here are my barrel GIS coordinates. So yeah, good point. And I uh, hope this measuring tool it becomes very useful for you like it is for me and Ben and um yeah make full use of it so awesome yeah cool so that was the graphical cross-section editor that was our uh tip on the measuring tool and uh we're super excited to be able to share that with you so uh that's all for this episode and uh, i want to thank everyone for tuning in remember tell us all about your favorite sports team 
and what you miss about it and uh, put that right in the comments of this video. Yeah, and if you guys have any other questions about the graph graphical cross-section editor or the measuring tool, feel free to leave that in the comments too and we'll try to address those uh, on the next episode. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for joining. This has been Full Momentum and HEC RAS Vodcast.